Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Well, today is, as it should be, a, a day dedicated to studying North Korea. I think so. <laughs> we had Admiral Thomas Fargo come around. Uh, he was the Pacific commander for a while, and uh, familiar with at least how it looked from the military. Uh, and you are a citizen diplomat, and you have specific thoughts, and you've been there many times, and you've been thinking about this since your time in the Army in, the, in 1820, wasn't it? It was the War of 1812. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, here we go. So, um, some really interesting things have happened in the past few days, and there's, you know, the whole game seems to be changing, and, uh, and the, the possibilities, the options, they're changing, the likely outcomes are changing, uh, and certainly your thoughts have been changing. How are your thoughts now? Well, they have. Enough things have happened that have never happened before that I'm now satisfied that a meeting will happen which means that the brave new world is upon us now because um, these kind of things never happened before. We've been through presidencies five and six in number spanning 30 years or more where nothing has been done. The U.S. pattern of behavior, which was imposed upon us really by the State Department, is to uh, disavow any meeting with the North Koreans unless and until, first, they have to um, agree to uh, forswear any interest in nuclear weapons. Well, that's their, that's their leading calling card. That's their main, um, that's their card. That's the card they play. And, of course, um, we have to uh, tell them that the United States well, will... But hasn't he acceded to this? He said, I'm not going to... Oh, he has now. Not, he has now. That's what makes it I different. I mean, he said it in English, and he said it to the world, and the world, um, you know, there's no ambiguity about this. Is there or is there? I'm telling you, at a given date in either late May or early June, two guys with funky haircuts are going to meet somewhere and talk for a while. My prediction would be that they will meet in a small city in the free world, because Kim Jong-un, like his father and like his grandfather, has never answered to a hostile press. They've, they've never put themselves in that situation. And that's why every time there's a meeting between North and South, it always happens in Pyongyang, and it probably always will. So those, those are the... Uh, th that's the lay of Are the land. Are you saying this meeting is going to happen in Pyongyang, too? No. As a matter of fact, I'm telling you, it won't happen anywhere on the Korean Peninsula because Trump, being the negotiator that he is, will not allow Kim Jong-un to have home field advantage. <laughs> oh. That's why the, the real uh, likelihood is that um, it'll be in a place like Reykjavik, a small city in Iceland where Gorbachev and Reagan met, or it could be where um, President Ford met in, uh, in um, um, one of the smaller... Uh, what about Hawaii? No, because it's the United States. It gives us home field advantage. And the press would be here in droves. Oh, can you imagine? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... Helsinki, Helsinki, Finland is another good example of a very small locale where they could have a meeting and don't expect a lot of advance notice because they don't want to give the press advance notice and they would like very much to have all the rooms and all the facilities sold mm -hmm. out so that not everybody can uh, get in. Of course, you yeah. and I could get in easily <laughs> because we're established. Well, those, you're right. Those cities are relatively small. I yeah. think they're, both of them are less than 300,000 or something like that. Yeah, that's right. And they've been used before with success. Uh, Gerald Ford met with Brezhnev in, uh, in uh, Finland. Yeah, okay, so. anyway, so you think, what I get, Pat, is you think this meeting will happen. It will happen, and because it happens, the world is automatically different, because since the, and, uh, since the war, we have never met with a North Korean leader. Kim Il-sung, during the, during the time of detente back in the 70s, actually thought, really thought, that he would get an invitation to the White House because all of the Warsaw Pact countries 
over on the other side of the globe were also getting invitations because they were, uh, Nixon was trying to wean um, uh, the, the um, Warsaw Pact countries away from Russia to gain advantage over them. Now, and that's why he went to China. Some people think that, it, that just to meet with Kim Jong-un, just for Trump, just to meet with him, that's giving up too much. No, you, no. You have is, to, is that giving up anything significant? It's giving up something, and it's something that we should want to give up because what we're, what we're saying to the whole world is we, as the leader of the free world and effectively of the world, are approachable. The one thing that looks uh, rigid and, um, and inflexible is the notion, because we've always said the State Department has led us down this path, and it's, it's not a good choice. Yeah. They've led us down the path of saying, the only way we'll meet with you is in six-party talks, the two Koreas, uh, Japan, Russia, China, U.S. We'll only meet you in six-party talks. Now, you and I both know that you don't get anything done with a committee. <laughs> when I was stationed in Korea, I remember that the, uh, the Catholic pastor always said, God so loved the world that he did not send a committee. <laughs> so it has to be a one-on-one -on -one meeting between, uh, between uh, North Korea and the United States. And it shows a flexibility which changes things completely. One thing I can tell you for sure, Go fast forward to 2020. I know Trump is running. I don't know whether he'll win or lose, but I know one thing's for sure. The Democratic nominee will have a plan for how to deal with North Korea. There may be economic elements to it. There may be military elements, but the Democratic nominee will have a plan mm -hmm. for how to deal with North Korea, mm -hmm. and it will, be, it will have a detail that you've never seen before at well, all. Because they'll be criticizing whatever Trump does, won't they? Not only criticizing, but they'll be saying, we can handle it better, and they'll have a plan for handling it better. Because it's a big issue. Because look, once one president meets with Kim Jong-un, a North Korean leader, another one will, once a, once a and another better one will. him, and so forth. That's it. Yeah. That's it. So the let, status let's talk quo, about what... The status quo is over as of now. It's already changed. <coughs> let's talk about what... Kim Jong-un is looking for? That's a very good question. Yeah. And, and you'd be amazed. One of the things they're looking for uh, derives from what Kim Il-sung said in the 70s. I never get an invitation to the White House. They want respect. And they're getting it by virtue of this conference. That's why um, if we have to surrender something in the deal, let's stop thinking about lose, who's winning and who's losing. And let's uh, figure out a way for everybody to win. For one thing, is it worth our trouble to um, talk about regime change? I would say no. Uh, we didn't get it, at this point, it's we quite didn't get it in Cuba, and we didn't get it in Germany. Yeah. What happened is Germany evolved out of communism, and that's the best we can hope for. Yeah. The other thing is this. Um, I, I would hope that we can talk the North Koreans out of nuclear weapons, but if we can't, uh, every other country in the world that we tried to talk out of it, we failed. Look at what happened so recently. In 2011, we practically, in order to catch uh, Osama bin Laden, we invaded Pakistan. Pakistan has the bomb, but whoever talked about, oh, maybe we'll, maybe we'll have a bomb dropped on us, the mutually assured destruction that we've operated on for so long tells countries no matter what their makeup is, no matter how radical they may otherwise seem, it tells them don't push the button because if you push the button, this is true of the United States too, if you push the button, a button will be pushed dedicated to you. That's, that is mutually assured or maybe, 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 maybe it's like World War One, you know, it's like that's all a chain reaction kind Could of thing. Be. Could be. Literally a chain reaction. Yeah. So, but, you know, would you agree with me that, um, that his comment, Kim Jong-un's comment about seeking a better economic future for North Korea is the core point here? This it's, is, it's one of them. We haven't ever talked about commercially uh, connecting with North Korea, but there's no reason it couldn't happen. Uh, and I think you'll hear more talk along that vein uh, in the near future. What, is there anything necessarily wrong with weaning North Korea off of China so that now 
uh, their, their quasi-alliance with the U.S. makes the Chinese a little worried. Here's what the Chinese are worried about. Ever since the time of Mao Zedong, they have not wanted U.S. troops anywhere near their border. And what uh, Douglas MacArthur was threatening when he said, hey, this is World War III, you know, let's, let's go for the, the big win. And that's why they went all the way up to the Yalu River. And that was the time when the Chinese invaded with their 200,000 volunteers. That was the time they did, not before. Mao Zedong, we provoked them, is what you're saying? That's, that's actually true. That's actually true. Once uh, we were past the 38th parallel into what now is North Korea, we provoked them. And that's the result that we got. Okay. Let's take a short break. That's Pat Border, uh, an interested uh, diplomat, a citizen diplomat. Uh, we're going to come back and talk about exactly what is going on with China and this deal with North Korea. There's a lot of wrinkles to that. It's kaleidoscopic. We'll be right back. Soto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. <music> Okay, we're back, we're live with Pat Border, who has followed Korea, North Korea, for a lifetime, really. It's, it's been um, 40 years, because yeah. I started in the South. Yeah, and, um, <clears throat> and today he's a citizen a diplomat, and he follows it by going there, by studying it. Today, we're talking about, um, you know, the, the extraordinary events that have taken place over the past, what, week or so, um, and China. You know, I thought that China was engaged somehow you know, a sort of combined strategy with North Korea. But I think that's probably not so. Um, its self-interest is, is uh, predominant here. And then there was this article recently suggesting that they kind of lost control of what North Korea is doing. So what do you think? China is like the parent of a misbehaving child. And they are, for the first time, having to rein in that child. I think it's enormously significant that uh, Kim Jong-un took the night train to Beijing under instructions. We're, for the first time, we're beginning to realize that North Korea is, a, is essentially a vassal state of China. China has absolute sway over North Korea. On every trip that I've ever taken to North Korea, I've had the best food, Western and Korean, and others as well. Um, there, there are fresh eggs, there's uh, bakery goods, uh, there's there's uh, um, particularly fruits, more fruits than vegetables. And if you go to the International Club, you can get the best beef, even yeah. though your typical North Korean never tastes beef, whereas yeah, it may be... He's still starving. That's right. That's right. So. And so um, China has been the supplier and the benefactor of North Korea, and you're absolutely right. Um, and it's only come at a time, and I don't know whether Trump planned this, or whether, whether it just fell in his lap. But this threat on um, a trade war has got the Chinese spooked. And it should, because China manipulates its currency. If they want to have good trade relations and have the, the best in the way of uh, exports, they manipulate their currency so it's cheaper compared to the dollar. They can do that all the time. We can't, we don't have the luxury of doing that because we are the world's currency. We can't do that sort of thing. So um, they, they're finding themselves in a very precarious situation. Look at it this way. Let me put it to you this way, because I know you know the answer to it. Would you rather have a trade war with China or a nuclear war with North Korea? 
That's, that's just the way it is. And, and <laughs> Trump, I think, knows that, but it operates whether he knows it or not. I'm not, I'm not claiming that you know, Trump is um, Nixonian in his wisdom, but um, he's, he's done a pretty good job of pairing two issues, just as you were saying. So how does this deal affect China, though? Um, in other words, it sounds to me like China, although China, you said, instructed Kim Jong-un to come, come to Beijing and all that, and they probably had some suggestions for him. Um, but the bottom line is that he's like, like the wayward son. He's going to do what he's going to do. Uh, he's got his own agenda going on. Is that what you're saying? And China, to a point, yes. But he he is a vassal state. He relies for support upon his benefactor. And if that's ever withdrawn, North Korea won't stand up for a very long time. The message that I would like to convey to you is that the reason they have lots of food for foreign travelers. I, I've been in huge um, um, places where. You know, they were serving breakfast to hundreds, even thousands of people, and it's all good Western food that um, keeps people coming for their tours. And if they ever shut off that lifeline, that'll go immediately. In other words, um, the hardship will be spread to everyone, including the travelers, and so it, will, it will ruin the industry. China want to see a deal between the United States and North Korea or not? It's probably, probably it does, because it wants North Korea to survive. Ever since Mao's time, one of the most uh, fervent beliefs, fears, if you will, was that uh, there would be U.S. troops on the Chinese border, and they want that buffer. They want it to survive. So if we consider that as part of what we're willing to deal with, then that means China can be accommodated at the same time that our interests can be accommodated, and is it possible that the North Koreans would actually give up nuclear warfare and, and nuclear um, weapons? Is it? It's possible. Um, no country, well, actually Libya forswore um, nuclear weapons back before 2010, but one of the arguments within North Korean circles is yeah, they did, and that's why Gaddafi fell, because he didn't have nukes anymore. That's, that belief actually has some currency uh, within the discussion. It's a fascinating topic, and, uh, but I, it's, it's clear from the things that are happening that everything is negotiable, that North Koreans dropped their demand that the U.S. forces leave Korea. They dropped it. We dropped the command as a part of this meeting that the North Koreans forswear for all times nuclear weapons. That's all on the table. So we can negotiate all of it, and we don't really know what will end up. But my point to you here and now today is that even if no agreement comes out of it, this is different uh, because one of the great roadblocks to an accommodation has been solved. And that's why uh, I say for the North Koreans, give them a win, okay? So if Kim Jong-un wants to look like uh, the big man on campus back home and he can show photos of himself with Donald Trump, it's a reasonable um, concession to them to do that because, you know, when are we going to finally do this? This has been going on for 70 years. There has to be an end to it. And, and the more that um, we can be accommodated by the North Koreans, the easier that life gets in South Korea because they'll be more at ease and maybe we can spend a little bit less. Now remember, Germany is a perfect example because uh, originally in the 60s, um, the Germanys were uh, bitter opponents and then Nixon came along with detente in the 70s and eased it up so they both had diplomatic ties with each other and now they're so warm that the Chancellor of Germany is a former East German politician. Angela yeah, Merkel is from East Germany. Yeah, right, right. So uh, the chances for improvement and the chances for surprising events happening is, is, uh, is quite within contemplation. We can do a lot better. And the North Koreans are not the only people uh, who have mm, maybe not been the best of neighbors. In some ways, we haven't. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think the State Department is in for a lot of criticism because you can name so many countries where the State Department got involved and we got in a mess. The, the, the best example of all is China itself. For 22 years, 
We didn't have any relations with him. And do you know that when Richard Nixon went to China, he arranged it privately through Pakistan, and the State Department didn't know about it. Henry Kissinger and wasn't there. Henry Kissinger was there, but he was not the Secretary of State. He was in the White House as an advisor to Nixon, and he was the one who used the back channel of Pakistan to set up the whole thing. So he set it up, but and, he wasn't Secretary of State. Now, what, what about the Mike Pompeo thing? Um, the, the, still, even now today, we're not sure the State Department is really involved in setting this up. The State Department has been you know, oh, yeah, They're, they're naysayers all the time. We've had problems with China. We had problems with Vietnam. We had problems with Cuba. And now we're having problems with uh, North Korea. Are any, is anybody surprised? I'm not. And, no. you know, when, I mean, I actually saw a story in the New York Times where they said, the whole thing is going to hell because our senior Korean diplomat, Joseph Yoon, is retiring. And he's retiring because he's hopping mad because they're not dealing with the State Department. He was in office for 30 years. What did he do for us for the past 30 years? Nothing. Have a happy retirement, Joe. We don't need you. <laughs> That's my message. Got it. Because the state what about the possibility of reunification? Does this take us closer to that, or, or does it have no effect on that? You have to wait for the regime in God. I'm sorry. I tried to turn this off. We have to, um, we have to see what happens first in uh, within the communist world, and that is, um, will they, will the communist world uh, cave in on its own? Because wherever that, wherever we gained against the communists, it's not because we conquered them, it's because they failed on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Berlin Wall came down because Mikhail Gorbachev decided, I can't afford this anymore. I can't afford to send in troops to Germany to keep the wall up, so they tore it down. And that's why it happened. It was out of a sense well, of Kim weakness. Kim Jong-un is not going to give up his control. Of North he won't Korea. give up his control, but his position is determined by how much his benefactor, the Chinese, will give him. And so uh, that's susceptible to changes that could over be changed. time. Okay. Last and, question. And, and the more, let me make this final point, the more that uh, China suffers from the economic situation, a change in the agreement with the United States, the more they suffer, the less they can afford. You got to think about that. To prop up North Korea. The Chinese are building high-rise buildings that won't be occupied for 25 years. And they're bringing in people from the countryside who are going to have to find their way back to the countryside on their own because the Chinese are not going to send them back. Mm -hmm. They're using labor as they need it, as they think they need it, today, but in order to keep the economy humming, they're building buildings. That's what you do when you're in a slump and you want to, you know, that's, that's what we did during the Great Depression. So it depends on their economy. We invented jobs. Yeah. Last question. Um, you know, you're optimistic about this. My, my perception is you've always been optimistic about the possibilities of a kind of detente with North Korea. Somehow. Yes, I would say yes. <clears throat> but what about the worst case analysis, Pat? Uh, isn't, isn't it possible, and, and a lot of people have speculated on this, uh, that Trump would either not have this meeting or go to this meeting and there would be an argument that would lead to, you know, uh, a, a degradation of whatever advantage we've had in setting it up? Uh, you're right. Um, you don't know that Trump won't walk out on it, but the next president could be a Democrat or it could be a different Republican. And I'm betting that in the long run, not tomorrow, not six months from now, but in the long run, a president will meet a dictator and he won't walk, she won't walk out of it. So um, the, the possibilities are endless. Now I'm disappointed, are we close to the end of time? Yeah. Okay, I, I was disappointed because I told you that there was a, um, um, a Vulcan proverb that was involved, and I was hoping that you would ask me what Vulcan proverb did Spock invoke to support peace between the Klingons and the Federation? And in the 23rd century, do you want to know what that? Yes, I do. Okay, I was hoping you'd ask. I, yeah, I, 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 I consider the question asked. Okay, uh, in, in uh, Star Trek VI, 
he said, the old Vulcan proverb is, only Nixon could go to China. <laughs> and there you have it. <laughs> the ultimate wisdom <laughs> from Pat Porter, a citizen diplomat, uh, comes to talk to us about North Korea, and I think he'll be back. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Thank you.